Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming here today to uh, the Garvin's 2012 um, Immunology Public Seminar. It's great to see so many uh, smiling faces here, and hopefully we can uh, get over to you today some of the wonders of the thing which is the immune system and, uh, and tell you a bit about some of the times when it plays up and perhaps doesn't do what we want it to do and, and what we can do about that. Um, as well as the people here today, I'd also like to uh, welcome uh, the online viewers to, to this uh, um, set of talks, which will be, uh, is being webcast, and also uh, will be uh, made available as a podcast later. If uh, you wanted to pick up any of those things, you might miss the first time round. We're very fortunate today to have a, a great list of speakers uh, to tell you about various aspects uh, of the immune system and, and immune disease. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll be giving you a little bit of an overview and talking to you about antibodies to, to kick off. Uh, afterwards, Tree Fan from the Garvin will be uh, giving us a, a, an insight into deep into the tissues of the body and how, and how cells move around inside the body uh, using some great new technology. Stephen Adelstein uh, from Prince Alfred Hospital will follow after that to tell us about uh, autoimmune disease uh, lupus, systemic lupus erythematosus, uh, following which will be uh, a brief morning tea to uh, refuel the energies. Uh, and then after that, uh, Professor Connie Catalaris will tell us uh, about food allergies, which promises to be a, a great insight to that a really uh, very topical disease. And to finish off, we'll have Cecile King from the Garvin to tell us uh, about type 1 diabetes and related autoimmune diseases. So uh, we have a packed schedule. So without any further ado, I might uh, start off with the first talk which is going to appear magically, it seems. Uh, wonderful. Okay. So, the immune system. You probably have a bit of an idea of what it does, but um, at the risk of saying the obvious, uh, well, to, to define it in one line, um, which may not be the normal way to think about it, but what the immune system does is actually recognise and destroy foreign entities. So by foreign, uh, actually we mean anything which doesn't look exactly like one of your cells, one of your own proteins or constituents. And it doesn't even have to be radically different, it just has to be a bit different. Uh, the immune system has an incredible way of telling the difference and directing its destructive capacity at things which essentially don't belong. So when we think about the way the immune system works, most of the time when we think about these foreign entities, we're, 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 we're talking about things like viruses, very small, uh, um, very small uh, biological uh, entities, uh, and of course, you know, these are the things which gives us uh, diseases such as these. Um, uh, the other common one we think about is bacteria, a bit larger uh, than a virus. It's a, it's a single cell, a single small cell, and responsible for its own uh, slew of diseases, uh, including these particular ones here. And even larger still, but still quite small, are, are, are the parasites, which can, which can enter the body and find a home there and cause diseases such as malaria, Lyme disease, and um, for those of you who remember the, uh, the, the scare in the, in the water a few years ago, cryptosporidiosis is, a, is another type of um, parasite. So in all these cases, you know, these are all illnesses, obviously, and the immune system uh, can't get the, rid of these things as soon as they enter the body. So uh, when they enter the body, they grow, multiply, and it takes some time for the immune system to recognise them and get rid of them. And so, obviously, we're, we're sick for a while until that can happen. Um, because the immune system doesn't necessarily know we're being infected by something which is, which is uh, going to, uh, is pathogenic or makes us sick, uh, it'll also respond to a vaccine. And the whole idea behind a vaccine then is that it looks like these guys and, and, and we can make a response to it. And so, instead of seeing when the um, when the microbe enters the body and having to produce a response to get rid of it, we've already made a response which will recognise these things as they go in the body, which is the idea behind vaccines, which we'll I'll talk a little bit about in a second. Okay, so the immune system recognises foreign entities. So it's great that it recognises all those other things which, which uh, infect us and cause disease. But the immune system only knows if something's foreign. It doesn't know if we want it there or if we prefer that it didn't respond against it. It just knows it's foreign and, and wants to get rid of it. And so uh, the great, one of the great uh, issues in this area is, is organ transplants. Obviously, you know, it'd be great in an organ transplant if the immune system didn't say, well, this isn't part of us, we want to get rid of it. Um, and that's the big challenge around organ transplants. And so, as you probably know, the more it 
an organ can look like us, you know, guarantee you your identical twin if you're very fortunate, but certainly a family member, the more it looks like us, then the immune system is going to get um, upset about it and, and try to rid it from the body. Um, allergens are another case. In, in, in pretty much all cases, uh, the, the, the things which enter the body and cause us to have allergic responses and cause diseases such as asthma and asthma, and food allergies aren't dangerous to us, but it's in fact the response to those allergens which give us the problem. And, then, and, and Connie's going to tell us a lot later about a particular case in, this, in, in these diseases in, in terms of food allergies. Sometimes um, the immune system uh, makes a response and the response itself is what makes us sick. And, uh, and, and you know, uh, we often, in these uh, cases, have to try and tone down the immune response and, and it's a toxic shock. And in case of the meningitis, where, where the immune system's fighting off things in, in, your, in your central nervous system, sometimes the, the, uh, the fight can, can cause more damage or just as much damage as the, the thing which is causing the infection. So the other thing to remember is, like all of us, the immune system isn't perfect. Um, whilst it's always uh, trying to rid uh, foreign things from the body, sometimes it can make a mistake and instead of uh, uh, it can think part of us is actually foreign and launch an immune response against that. And so there's a whole uh, a slew of diseases which, which uh, are caused by this type of mistake. 5% uh, of us during our life will get what's called an autoimmune disease, which is basically when the immune system uh, is mistaken part of us for something that's foreign and needs to be gotten rid of. Um, uh, and, and these range from diseases, uh, there's a lot of these, some of them quite rare, this one's relatively common, uh, and, and which is, a, is a, when the body attacks the, uh, when the immune system attacks the body on a, on a, on a widespread scale to, to give us a, a disease called lupus, which uh, Stephen Edelstein will talk to us about uh, later about uh, uh, new, new advances in this particular disease. Other types of autoimmune disease are more directed and they can actually fight against one particular part of your body. Uh, and a common example of this is when the immune system attacks the beta cells of the pancreas, which is the type 1 of juvenile diabetes. And another one, which is probably less well known, is Sjogren's syndrome, where your immune system attacks your salivary glands and your tear ducts, and you actually, uh, uh, you know, you, you kind of, if, uh, your saliva production and, and, and ability to produce tears goes away. And so Cecile, Cecile King has some insights uh, in particular with these two types of autoimmune disease, which we'll talk about later. Okay, so the immune system, uh, we know what it does, a little bit now about how it does it. So the immune system is a collection of cells. Um, I listed all the types of cells in the immune system. We'd be here all day. I'll, I'll talk about a few of the, uh, of the main, uh, main characters in this. Uh, first of all is the B cells, which is actually my particular interest. And, and so the B cells, which you may have heard of, are the source of antibodies in the body. And so this is, um, you know, it looks a bit like the Death Star, but uh, it's not actually a real B cell. Um, I think it's an artist's impression of a B cell. So uh, the point here is that a B cell uh, produces these things called antibodies, which is one of our, one of our main... Uh, weapons of attack against infections, and, uh, and I'll talk uh, about this in a, in a uh, bit more detail soon. Um, and here, the B cell basically spits out these antibodies, and the great thing about antibodies is they can seek out the foreign invaders, stick to their surface, and, and start the process of getting them out of the body. So in this particular, I guess, I think that's another artist's impression of antibodies uh, attacking a virus. So uh, as well as B cells, there are T cells, uh, and in particular, uh, particularly relevant in our, in our fight against infections are these uh, T cells called killer T cells. And so when I, when I looked at that picture, which actually is a real picture, I mean, they're not really uh, orange and pink, I don't think, that's a pseudo color, but, but this is actually a, a killer T cell which has found a cell in the body which has been infected with a virus. And so um, uh, even though uh, this cell is part of our own body, and I guess you could call it self, the fact that it's been infected with a virus makes the immune system see it as not self anymore. So it's you know, it's a cell which is producing virus and needs to be cleared out of the body. Uh, and, and these killer T cells are amazing in that they can specifically seek out these cells and latch onto the surface here, you know, I mean, that looks like a bit of a passionate embrace there, but it is in fact the, uh, the kiss of death. So uh, a bit further down the track, what happens is the T cell releases uh, uh, components out of itself and into this infected cell. And actually, this is a, this is a, See it there is a is a hole that's been punched into into the side of the of the infected cell, and effectively it's going to deflate like a balloon now and and, and, and fall apart and die. And so, um, so killer T cells are a really uh, critical part of our uh, fight against uh, infections, particularly viruses when they've got into cells, and, and actually against cancer as well, which I'll touch on a little bit later. 
Uh, just one other cell I'll quickly mention are the macrophages, which, which literally means the big eaters. And so they're bigger than the, the B and T cells. And in fact, what they do is, is uh, uh, go around the body recognising um, bacteria in particular. They're able to recognise them, latch onto their surface and put them, ingest them inside the, inside the, uh, inside the cell. And inside the cell they have a whole uh, mess of toxic chemicals which they, which they keep safely uh, entrapped inside there, but it, which expose, they expose the bacteria to and thus uh, and kill the bacteria off that way. Uh, there are actually some very clever bacteria which uh, have learned to live inside macrophages and, and produce you know, some of the particularly nasty diseases like tuberculosis. So there's, there's a constant struggle between what these microbes can do and what the immune system can devise to fight them. Okay, so the immune system, it's, it's everywhere. So it's constantly surveying our whole body, looking for signs of invaders and, 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 and tracking them down and, and fighting them. And so this is a, a bit of a picture of the different components of the immune system which, which are spread throughout the body. And uh, you, you may or may not know, but our whole, our whole immune systems are generated from inside our bones. Inside the bone marrow, you've already heard of people getting bone marrow transplants. So a lot of the time the reason for that is you can, you can put in a whole new immune system and, and actually your red blood cells too. By, by putting in bone marrow and, and into a, and, uh, and, and the bone marrow cells produce all the immune system cells which, um, which can uh, track out of the bone marrow and colonise all these various organs around the body, the lymph nodes, the tonsils and adenoids, uh, the spleen, and also along the, along the gut is, is a major immune organ actually, and there's these, these things called the, the bit white lymph nodes, payers patches, which trail along the gut. And, um, and, that, and that there's a constant supply of these cells coming out around the body uh, to, uh, to provide the soldiers in the fight against, uh, fight against invaders. And what's particularly important is, as I mentioned, there's a lot of cells in the immune system, a lot of different cells, and they need to communicate with each other. And so within each of these organs, like the lymph nodes and the spleen, uh, cells move around in, in critical ways to, 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 to make an immune response. And, and Tree Fan will, will talk a bit about how we are able to follow these sort of movements and get clues about how immune responses are put together. So just, just briefly, because I've got B cells and the rest, so pretty much all immune cells, uh, except T cells, go through this track. And so I don't know if many of you have heard of the thymus. It was a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an organ actually just sits just above your heart. And one of the great Australian uh, discoveries of what the thymus does. So in fact, the T cells actually have to move from the bone marrow to the thymus. And it's in the thymus where all the, uh, most of the cells which could make you have an autoimmune disease gotten rid of. It's not perfect, but you know, 95% of them, 99% of them have gotten rid of there. And so the T cells are unique that they go through the thymus and then they go out to the rest of the body. Okay, so um, this slide is just to remind me to tell you how they get around the body. So if you can imagine you're in a big tube here, this is a, just a blood vessel uh, with the epithelial cells around the outside. And so we've, we've zoomed right down now to the, to the cellular size. And so within the blood, as you know, you've got all your red blood cells which carry your oxygen around. But there's a minor, although very important component, which are your white blood cells. And so these are essentially all your cells of the immune system. And so the way uh, cells travel around the body through these different organs are through the blood vessels, also through the lymphatic vessels, which, uh, which you may know about. Okay, so that particular magnification we were just on, you can probably zoom in another hundredfold now, hundred times smaller, and we can start talking about uh, some of the ways and the, the weapons of the immune system. And so what I'll talk about a bit today is the antibody. So you probably all have heard about antibodies. This is actually what we think they look like in, at, a micro, at a micro scale from very young, uh, fine mapping through a, a, a process called X-ray crystallography. So the, an antibody has this kind of uh, two arms and a, and a stalk shape to it. And, and what we know about antibodies is that uh, they have this stalk region is what's called a constant region. So every, every antibody basically that you look at looks the same in this constant region. But the, so, but the really amazing thing about antibodies is that pretty much all, each antibody has a different uh, balloon here on the top, the variable region. So uh, any antibody you look at and compare the constant regions, they look the same, however the variable regions are different. And so this is actually the key to, to the way the body is able to make an immune response against so many different things. If you think about all the different viruses and bacteria, and things, it's, there's actually not enough genes in the body to, to give you uh, all, the, all the antibodies that you might need. So there's a, a very neat process, which I don't have time to go into, which shuffles genes around and basically makes all the antibodies different. And so the key to having all these different antibodies is, is that making immune response is all based on structure. The, probably if you imagine a lock and a key, what, uh, if we uh, consider a virus, that's actually an HIV virus, um, 
uh, a model of one anyway. Um, you can see uh, the virus itself has all sorts of lumps and bumps all over the surface. It has its own particular structure, and this structure is essentially unique to this virus. And so what the immune system has to do is find a way of uh, recognising this virus uh, in such a way that it can target it uniquely. And so out of all the different antibodies that are around, what the immune system will do is find the ones which can stick precisely to this particular virus and won't stick to yourself or you know, probably won't stick to a bacteria or, or anything else. And by these variable regions, so these variable regions allow these antibodies just to bind to this virus. And so they won't bind to your heart or anything else and cause you hopefully an, an autoimmune problem, but they'll stick very specifically to this virus. And so the variable regions do that, and the role of the constant region is essentially to stick out like that and act like a waving flag. And so you might remember the macrophages I talked about previously, which can chew things up. What the macrophage will see is, is a virus or, or a cell covered in antibodies and say, okay, that's foreign. I can go and chew that up and, and digest it. Okay, so how do we get the antibodies? Um, as I mentioned, all the cells we have in the immune system come out of the bone marrow. And uh, so the bone marrow is constantly producing B cells. And each B cell it produces is essentially the same, except for the antibody it has sticking out of the surface of the cell. So, so each B cell has its own unique surface antibody, which is meant to be represented by these, these different shaped things. And so there's only four here, but if you multiply that by a billion, you've got a better idea of the many different numbers of B cells that the bone marrow is constantly producing. So how does this help? All these different B cells. Well, here, come the, here comes the foreigners. So, well, sorry, sorry, the bacteria, the invaders. <laughs> the, uh, the virus and bacteria. <laughs> Let's not get xenophobic here. Um, so, uh, so, so once, once something foreign enters the body, then that's when the, when the soldiers are mobilised. But which ones to mobilise? Out of all these B cells, there's only going to be a very small fraction which are going to be any good because there's only going to be a very small fraction which will have antibodies which will stick to these. Um, so how do we get those going? So basically, uh, uh, the B cells are sitting around. A very small fraction of them will have surface antibodies which are, are going to be able to stick to this virus. And so, hey presto, we know which ones we have to get going. So what happens then is that uh, these cells which have stuck onto the virus or bacteria move to a specific place uh, in, in, the, in the lymph node or the, or the spleen. And the first thing they do is make copies of themselves because these are only around in very small numbers and uh, not in large enough numbers to make a big response. So part of the process of getting the immune, immune response going is for the, the cells we know to copy themselves so we've got more of them. And so when your lymph nodes are getting swollen, that's what's happening. That's your, that's your, your soldiers multiplying, a bit like the, the Clone Wars in Star Wars, we'll have seen that. Um, so, so the first step is to get lots of soldiers and then the next one is to arm them up. So at the moment these, these cells just have their antibodies sticking off the surface. So in itself, that's not any use. But what they do is to undergo a process where they change the way they make the antibodies. And so instead of having them on the surface, what they turn into is what's called a plasma cell, which is a factory for these antibodies. But instead of having them on the surface, they spit them out, a bit like that picture I showed before. And into your blood and, and, and into your circling or activating around your body, you just generate masses of these antibodies. And the great thing about these antibodies is that we know from the very first event over here that they stick to the virus. So they go out into the blood, out circulating around the body, and they'll stick to the virus. And as I mentioned, once they've done that, they're able to recruit in a whole lot of uh, what we call effectors, such as the macrophages, for instance. And uh, the secreted antibodies, off they go. So that in very, you know, very rapidly is, is the way the immune response works to get rid of, get rid of the invader. The great thing, though, is um, um, that once this has happened, you've still got all these antibodies here. So, um, and, and you've got these cells here. So for a long time, these antibodies will keep floating around your body. And so if this guy comes back again and tries to get in and, and give you another infection, you don't have to make a new immune response. You've got all the antibodies sitting right there, and it gets dealt with straight away. And so that's the whole idea behind vaccination. Instead of having to go through the infection in the first place, getting these B cells activated, you know, we, we, we get these B cells going with a, with a harmless protein or something so that all the antibodies are all sitting there ready to go. Uh, so if you get your flu vaccination this year, that's exactly what's happening. And that's called immunity. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so antibodies are obviously very powerful things. And so uh, it was realised um, uh, some time ago when we started learning about the uh, antibodies that these are potentially a very powerful tool that if we can harness their... their um, their uh, uh, destructive power 
or their ability to seek things out very specifically. And the thing to remember is, like I said, you know, we make them against viruses and bacteria, but in fact, if you put anything foreign into the body, we can make antibodies against it. Um, and so, for instance, you know, uh, it was thought a long time ago that you know, we know tumours make particularly different sort of molecules on their cell surface. So you know, if we could get antibodies to recognise uh, proteins on the surface of tumours, this could be a great way to you know, see where the tumour cells are, for instance, and potentially um, also have a way of making the immune system attack the tumours and, and, and get rid of them. So, for instance, the, uh, one of the early developments in this area was uh, uh, making antibodies against this protein CEA, which is particularly on colon cancer cells. Uh, and so, in fact, the mice, are, the mice are great in this case because we, we, we can produce the antibodies in mice very easily. You can't really go around immunising humans against this. Uh, and so, if we immunise mice against this, we can generate antibodies uh, against this particular protein, which would be potentially useful for, 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 for looking at cells with this protein on the surface. But, you know, it, we can't really just keep injecting mice uh, and, and getting serum out of there. It's, it's not very convenient. So uh, someone very clever, who got a Nobel Prize for it, uh, decided that uh, we, what we needed was a way of having a constant source of these sorts of things. And so, for instance, if we have a, a, a mouse which we've immunised with the CEA protein, we generate cells which have, make um, antibodies against CEA, and they dreamt of a process where you actually get a, 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 an antibody secreting cell which is a cancer cell, so it can actually grow in a plate forever, and so, you, uh, so it's very easy, to, very easy to handle. Uh, but it actually doesn't make it any antibodies itself. But if you fuse these, these cells to that particular cancerous plasma cell, you make plasma cells uh, which live forever, uh, not in your body, so we can just grow them in a, in, a, in a test tube. They live forever, but they actually make the antibody you want. So if you can go through and find uh, the, the, the cells that are fusing between these two, you've got a source of your, in this case, your anti-CEA antibody. And so what you can actually do is put them in a tube, they live very happily, and they'll just keep producing these antibodies. And then there's just this one antibody in the whole thing, so, uh, which is why it's called monoclonal, which just means one very specific type. Now, and these, some of you may have heard of hybridomas. So these are called hybridomas. So basically my way of making an antibody-producing cell live forever and acting as a constant source of the antibody. And so there's been a lot of activity and in in, in, in continuing to rise in, in, in using these antibodies as a, um, as, well, in a, a number of different ways, but, but particularly in a treatment and diagnosis of disease. So we can just pull all this, you know, the, the, the liquid out of here and just purify out these antibodies. And that's being used in a lot of cases uh, as a drug and, and, and in treatment and diagnosis of disease. And so one, uh, just to return to this example of the anti-CEA antibody, um, one early use for this, once they had a monoclonal antibody against this colon cancer protein, so they could put a radioact short-term radioactive label on the surface and, and inject it into a patient and use a PET scan and, and you can see where very easily there where the, uh, where the, where the tumour uh, is localised and that's just, so it's a great help in, term, in terms of the treatment and monitoring the progression of that disease. So monoclonal antibodies then, you might be surprised to know, and, and you may have heard some of the names of these things, but a lot of the new drugs, more than half of the new drugs in the pipeline are actually monoclonal antibodies. Uh, and the reason for this is that the, the, the monoclonal antibodies just exploits this, this, this great power of the immune system to make a very specific target which will just bind to one thing in particular. Um, and so in a lot of ways that can be useful in disease. So, uh, some of you may have heard of some of these, this is some of the, the, the common examples. So there's an antibody called, and they've all got these funny names, uh, but they're essentially just monoclonal antibodies of some description, so ones against TNF, actually reduce the inflammation associated with autoimmune disease. So, you know, they're all produced in mice and then made to be tolerated in humans. For allergies, there's, there's another one called Zolaire. Uh, rituximab attacks um, cells, uh, cell surface proteins on lymphomas. Perceptin is very commonly used. Um, uh, because it attacks cells uh, in breast cancer, uh, making this, this particular protein. Avastin has been used in, in a number of uh, tumour situations now. It actually it, it, it neutralises a molecule which is involved in giving the tumours a blood supply, so which is a sort of novel way of attacking cancer. And something I haven't really had, will have a chance to talk about today is the power of the immune system to fight tumours. So we know the immune system is becoming more and more apparent that the immune system is a really critical part of our defence against tumours. Again, it doesn't always work, but uh, it's potentially a way in which we can harness uh, the body's own powers to attack cancer. And there's a particular antibody which has been approved in, in, in the States for treatment of melanoma, which is shown in some efficacy, which basically 
lifts the break off the immune system and, and in some cases allows the immune system to fight off the tumour which has been growing in the body. Okay, I'll leave it there. Um, and we will have questions, so question and answer session at the very end. So you will have all forgotten about this talk by then, so <laughs> the other speakers can cover all the questions then. Um, so I will now um, move on now to our next speaker, who interesting here, is Dr. Tree Fan. So Tree Fan is a senior research officer in the immunology program here at the Garvin Institute. Tree completed his medical degree at Sydney University and trained at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, actually with Stephen, <laughs> some time ago. Um, uh, but instead of going straight into med medicine, uh, we were fortunate to have him move into medical research uh, full time. And he completed his PhD and, uh, and then moved to the University of San California, San Francisco, where he learnt uh, from one of the pioneering laboratories in this area of two-photon intrabital microscopy, which is a big mouthful, but it's the way we can look at cells moving in the body. Uh, he, he was recruited back here to the Garvin in 2007, where he runs his own research program and, and heads the Institute's two-photon two microscope facility, and he also has a clinical appointment at St Vincent's Hospital. So please uh, welcome Dr Trefak. Good morning, everybody. Um, so, okay. So, um, th this morning, uh, I want to tell you about Susie. So, we've been quite lucky um, in the immunology department to have had the support of um, the Garvin Research Foundation and some generous donors. And with their support, we've been able to acquire a two-phone microscope. So, this morning, I want to tell you about two-phone microscopy, the sort of work that's been done in the field, and then some of our contributions. Um, to it in terms of understanding how the immune system is organised and how things um, are brought to bear in our constant struggle to fight against uh, infections. So uh, as Stephen, I'm sorry, as Rob um, just explained, the, the immune system consists of multiple layers which comprise our lines of defence against threats um, imposed on us by the outside world. Um, the first layer, of the first line of defence consists of our skin and mucosal barriers. Um, and at the same time, these barriers, strategically um, placed um, around these barriers, are sentinel cells which can sample and sense the environment to, to detect uh, if there are threats um, being um, posed to our body because of uh, pathogens such as bacteria, viruses or parasites. And as well, we have immune cells which constantly recirculate between these um, multiple um, sites within the body um, as part of their patrol um, and as part of their surveillance. The next line of defence consists of a system for filtering and trapping pathogens that may have breached these initial lines. So if uh, bacteria, if you have a cut in the skin for example and some bacteria gains entry into the body, then these bacteria are drained in the lymph and they get trapped um, in that case um, uh, by the lymph nodes um, and, and bacteria that gain entry into the bloodstream are trapped um, by the spleen. So this system for trapping and filtering pathogens um, is very useful because not only can the uh, pathogens be destroyed within these sites, but these sites can then act as a staging ground in which to generate the adaptive immune response. And this is, this is a key aspect of the um, uh, mammalian immune system. And the key point here is that the adaptive immune response allows us to generate memory for the pathogen that's infecting us, that has infected us. So we generate long-term memory cells as well as cells uh, such as long-lived plasma cells um, which can provide us with long-term protection should, be, should we be re-exposed to the pathogen again. So the lymph node is the key staging ground then for the immune response and this is a schematic of the lymph node um, and it's very beautifully organised into a number of discrete microanatomical compartments. The T cells and B cells which Rob just told you about are localised in specific locations. So the B cells are found in the B cell follicle and the T cells are found within a region called the paracortex in the lymph node. And what happens is that pathogens would drain in from the periphery through the lymphatics into the lymph node and T and B cells enter the lymph node through the bloodstream and they're constantly recirculating. So they enter them through the bloodstream and they leave through the lymphatics and to, to migrate to different tissues. And so this is a key aspect of the immune response, the, the ability of cells to migrate from one place to the other. Um, and so what we really want to be able to do to understand the immune response is to be able to look deep 
inside a lymph node in a live animal as the immune response is um, being generated. And so what we need then to be able to do is to have the capacity to look deep inside a solid organ such as the, the lymph gland um, and to do it in real time um, as, as it's happening. And um, the way we can do that is with a two-fold microscope. So this is, this is Susie, so this is the microscope that uh, we've been able to set up here. And so just to tell you briefly what a two-photon two -photon microscope is, essentially it's um, a microscope that allows you to look um, deep into the tissues and the way it can do that is because it uses um, a near-infrared laser. So those of you who uh, remember your high school physics will know that the longer the wavelength of light, um, the deeper it can penetrate. And the near-infrared laser used by the two-fold microscope is in a wavelength that is correspond to what we call the optical window in the tissue. So we can't normally see through the body because we use visible light. But the infrared light uses wavelengths um, that um, can penetrate because it's not absorbed by things in the tissue such as um, the hemoglobin in your blood cells and, and fats um, and water. So um, this is critical because um, if we have cells that we make glow in the dark, then with the two-fold microscope, we can see these cells as they're moving around inside an intact lymph, lymph gland. Um, and the, the sort of energies that we used for two-fold microscope, microscopy are very low. Um, so that means that there's less damage to the tissues. And so we can image the tissue again and again. And by acquiring images over... Um, a period of time intervals, we can actually generate um, a real-time movie of what's happening inside the tissues. So just to give you an idea of how dynamic things are inside the lymph node, this is a three-dimensional movie um, of the lymph node. And in blue is the capsule, and so what you're seeing here is the collagen in the capsule of the lymph node. Um, and so that defines the boundaries. Um, we've actually labelled the B-cell follicle with um, a reagent, a an antibody, which I can show you here um, these uh, beautiful spidery network, network of um, uh, stromal cell fibres which provide the supporting framework for the actual follicle but also provides the actual mechanism by which the cells move. So the cells are actually migrating by crawling along these fibres. And in here, inside this lymph node we have red and green cells and you can see that in this, uh, in this movie the cells um, are constantly in motion. So. Can we use this to see what happens in an immune response? So if we have a, a, a cut in the skin, there's a breach, bacteria get in, what actually happens? So let's focus on the node, and in particular we'll focus what happens uh, at, in different locations at different times. We'll have a look in the, initially in the B-cell follicle, in the paracortex, then at the TB border, and then finally back into the germinal centre. So here uh, the movie is going to loop, and it's a... Um, uh, I'll explain what's going on. So, so in blue again here you can see the, the, the collagen, the capsule. Um, and so within minutes to hours of entry of a pathogen, um, what we find is that, um, that these pathogens have drained in the lymph to the lymph node and are trapped by macrophages that line the surface of, of the lymph node. So these sinus lining macrophages are, are fairly unique because while a macrophage is meant to be phagocytic, in other words, meant to be able to engulf and destroy things, these macrophages have evolved to be less phagocytic. So what they do is they retain these um, uh, pathogens on their cell surface and present them to these B cells, which here are green. So red in here are, uh, is a macrophage. Here is a process of the macrophage. And as the movie loops, you will see a green cell traveling up and down the process gathering antigen, so in other, in other words, becoming activated. And you'll see on the right here quite a few examples of cells travelling. Where's one? There's one there with the red cap. So what it's done is acquired the pathogen from the surface of the macrophage, the red, and uh, become activated, and now it's headed off in another direction. So the question is, where are, they, where are these cells go, going and what's happening? So that's what's happening within minutes to hours. A few hours later after that, in the paracortical T-zone, we have this process happening. And what's happening here is, on, on, if you concentrate on this movie, this green cell is what's called a dendritic cell. And there was a discovery of this cell that was uh, led to the award of the first posthumous Nobel Prize this year um, through Alf Steinman. And these cells are called dendritic cells because they extend these multiple branching arms, or dendrites, 
And you can see that it's a very dynamic process. They continuously extend and retract the processes, so they're probing the environment, they're looking for antigen. Um, and at the same time, the, in, the T cells, in this case, the red cells, are constantly moving around, interacting with these T cells, asking the question, is there a pathogen? Um, do you have a, something for me that, sh that should activate me and cause me to set up an immune response? And this is a, 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 um, a three-dimensional movie. So one, uh, the people who did this work encoded the movie on the right here based on the depth. So different colours represent different depths. So you can see that at multiple levels, the T cells are interacting with the dendritic cell. So, so that's within minutes the B cells get to hours the B cells get activated. A few hours after that, the T cells get activated, and then by about tw 12 to 24 hours, they've all relocalized. So the T cells have relocalized from the T zone and start heading towards the B cell follicle, and the B cells leave the B cell follicle and start heading more towards the T zone, and they meet halfway in between at the TV border. And this is what happens there. Here we have a B cell in red and a T cell in green, and for an immune response to occur, there's got to be a lot of checkpoints in place to make sure that you're generating a response that's specific for the pathogen, that's going to be effective in eliminating the pathogen, but at the same time, that's not going to generate any harm towards yourself. And so, one of the ways to do this is to generate the response in stages. So in this next stage of the immune response, the B cells have to talk to the T cells, and the T cells have to provide specific cues that tell the B cell that um, you know, essentially give the B cell the green light to go ahead and make the immune response. And so what you see is that the T cells and the B cells form these very stable long-term interactions. So much so that even though the B cell is migrating away from the T cells, the T cells hang on for dear life. And during this period of intense prolonged contact, there is communication between the two cells. This has been described by some uh, immunologists as, uh, as like a dance because the, the two cells form um, a conjugate and they move around in this sort of um, very um, choreographed um, uh, dance or waltz. I was going to play some music but the file doesn't work. <laughs> so what happens next? So then a week after this, after the B cells have been licensed to then go on and generate a response, they form journal centers. And within the journal centers, essentially, the journal center is the, um, the engine of the immune responses. This is where um, the long-term effectors like the long-lived memory cells, um, the long-lived plasma cells are generated. And so, as you can imagine, within this engine there's a lot of uh, cell division, a lot of new life being formed, um, and also at the same time a lot of death because some of the cells that are being generated may not be fit for making um, the immune response, they not, may not be very effective at neutralizing the pathogen, so they're no longer needed in the immune response. So you can see here that uh, these journal center B cells are in green, and what the, the um, people who d did this work um, have pointed out for us here is cells that are undergoing cell division. Um, here's another one that will probably undergo cell division. Um, and then also, as the cells die, they break up into tiny little pieces or blebs, and these then move off. So after this, pro this journal center reaction, we generate long lived memory and we long generate um, high affinity. Um, uh, plasma cells that can secrete high affinity antibodies. And these cells move off, they leave the lymph node, and then they migrate to the bone marrow where they take up residence. Um, so so that, that essentially is um, the sort of thing that we can do with the two-photo microscope. Um, but there are other things that we can do, and, and with the two-photo microscope we have it at the garden, we've not only looked at the lymph node or the lymph gland, we've also looked at the spleen, we can look at the liver, um, in collaboration with some people from Centenary. We can look at the skin, um, we can look at the gut, um, and we can also look at the immune response to cancers. So there's really no limit in terms of where we can look with the two-photo microscope, and, um, and so hopefully there will be lots of interesting work to come um, from the Garvin um, in these fields. But what else can we do with SUSY? Um, there's a couple of things. One of the things I mentioned was that um, immune cells migrate freely throughout the body and at the same time um, cells that are generated, for example the plasma cells, leave the lymph gland and migrate to the bone marrow. And what, what we have at the moment is a problem because when a cell leaves the imaging field we can no longer track it. So what we want to have is a mechanism with which to do that. And one of the exciting things that um, 
uh, we've been able to do um, with the two-photon microscope is take advantage of this protein called, called Kaidi, which is Japanese for the maple leaf, um, and it's an optical highlighter. It's a fluorescent protein, which is green, but when exposed to light, it becomes red. And so here's the green protein. If we expose it to light, it undergoes a chemical reaction and becomes a red fluorescent protein. So that means that if we use this protein, we can tag cells that we're interested in. We can tag the cells when they're in the lymph node and find them again in the bone marrow. In the same way, people have used um, GPS tracking devices to track the migration of birds and animals over large distances. Um, we can use this optical highlighter to track cells uh, within the, the body of a live animal. And so what I want to show you here to end up with is um, um, an example, uh, we're, uh, uh, something that we're quite proud of because we think this is uh, one of the first times that people have been able to optically highlight a single cell in a live animal. So this cell starts off being green and using the two photon laser um, we can actually keep track of it and then by the end of it convert it from green to red so it's going to loop over and over again. So this cell that was initially green at the end of the process is red and so now we can start looking for red cells in the bone marrow and we'll know that those cells, for example, have come from the lymph gland. So I might stop there and um, move on to... As long as it's not green. <laughs> so, um, just while we're setting up here, I'd like to uh, introduce our next speaker uh, for this morning. It's uh, Dr. Stephen Edelstein. Uh, Stephen Elstein is an immuno immunopathologist. He's a, a senior staff specialist and head of the clinical immunology department at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, where he uh, specialises in the treatment of autoimmune diseases. So he's involved in undergraduate teaching in the medical faculty at the University of Sydney and in postgraduate education for trainees in clinical immunology and immunopathology. And Stephen is going to talk to us today about uh, new ways of improving our ability to diagnose and monitor the autoimmune disease. SLA. Please welcome Stephen Ellis. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Rob, and thanks for the invitation. And it's really great to see so many people. Um, actually, I could see you better from down there. I can't actually see you from here because of the light. Um, we set this up, and what I didn't tell them is we just need to do a little bit of jigging so that I can... Um, and now you all have to turn upside down. <laughs> Uh, it's good for exercise, it's good for um, any moment now, I hope this will turn around. Um, this always works, I told them before, it always works. Um, I think it's easy if you go to talk standing on your head. <laughs> yeah, but you'd have to listen to it standing on your head too. Um, why is this not working? Uh, so, just let's go here. <coughs> And here, and it has worked. Um, in fact, this should be showing the whole screen, but it's not. But we can do it with this. Uh, and one other thing that I need to do. All right. So what I'm going to tell you about is um, one of the diagnostic tests that we use for when the immune system goes wrong, specifically to deal with a disease called systemic lupus erythematosus. And as both Tree and Rob have mentioned, uh, systemic lupus erythematosus is an immune-mediated disease when the immune system recognizes different organs, lungs or heart or skin or joints, um, and causes an inflammatory response. So the immune system identifies mistakenly these tissues as being worthy of an attack and starts to attack these organs 
And as you can see, it's a large number of organs, and in fact, just about any organ in the body can be the target of this immune attack that therefore leads to disease that we call systemic lupus erythematosus. The difficulty with systemic lupus, uh, lupus erythematosus, and I'm just going to call lupus or SLE from now on, um, is that it is so widespread and therefore difficult to diagnose. And you will know in the audience that there are lots of causes of arthritis. SLE is one of the causes of arthritis. How do we differentiate SLE from all the other causes of arthritis? And the best we've been able to come up with in the last 100 years of medicine is that there are criteria, clinical criteria, and there are 11 common manifestations of SLE, and people say that if you have four of these, you definitely have SLE. If you have three, maybe you have SLE. If you have two, well, it could be something else. If you have one, well, there are lots of causes of one of these diseases, one of these conditions like arthritis, for example. And then together with this, we have some laboratory criteria, which includes detection of some antibodies. And I've highlighted over here anti-SM antibodies, because I'm going to come back to anti-SM antibodies, because that's essentially what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, and, and the major reason for this is you can have SLE if you've only got one of these criteria, although it's highly unlikely that you would have only one of the criteria if you've got SLE. It's unlikely that somebody with SLE would only have kidney disease, nephritis, without having some abnormal laboratory tests as well. But it's not impossible that to classify it so that when we do trials, we know that everybody who is getting this trial medication has SLE, these criteria have been developed. Makes it very difficult to diagnose SLE because these criteria are complicated and often subjective, and um, there are problems with blood tests that I'll come to in a moment as well in making this diagnosis. And so therefore we think we require some better biomarkers to diagnose SLE. Most people mistakenly think that if you go and have a blood test, it's a black and white situation. You can have a blood test and it's abnormal, it's positive, as in the black square, or it's negative and it's normal. But unfortunately, that's not what it's, what it's like in real life. That's what we want, and that's what I'm going to hope, and that's what I'm telling you, the hope we're developing. But in fact, in real life, it's more a bit like that. And this problem over here is this sort of gray area where you may have a test, but it may be a false positive, or you may have the disease, and you may not have the positive test. And so this area deals with how specific the test is for that particular disease. And we want to develop a test for SLE that is particularly specific, and it's an immune test, and it's a test based on an antibody that uh, Rob has been talking to you about. Um, the test that's available at the moment, the best test, is a test for anti-DNA antibodies. These are antibodies that are made in many people with SLE. But in fact, only about 60, maybe 70% of people who have SLE actually are positive for this test, depending on how it's done. Although if you really do have this test, it's probably 95% likely that if you're positive, you will really have SLE. Can we do better than that? Um, and I've told you about that. So, let's come to SM. Um, and this is a published study of uh, tests that have looked at SM, anti-SM antibodies. And SM is a, a, SM stands for, in fact, Smith, because in the 1950s, Stephanie Smith was an American lady who, at the Rockefeller Institute in, in uh, New York, developed SLE, and her doctors at the, at the Rockefeller Institute found in her serum that she had this antibody. And then they then looked at a number of other people and found that, as I'll show you in a moment, 30% of people who had SLE have this antibody, and they called it anti-SM antibody after Stephanie Smith. Um, and um, Stephanie, actually, it's a fascinating story. If you Google it, she actually lived in the grounds of a hospital. And she was an artist. And she gave paintings. So um, if anybody's got any paintings you want to give <laughs> um, 
so um, anti-SM antibody is positive in 30% of people who have SLE. But that only identifies 30% of people who have SLE and not the other 70%. It is very specific. If you have an anti-SM antibody, you have SLE. And this is demonstrated in this diagram over here, which is what's called a rock curve, or a receiver operating characteristic curve. And I'm not going to go into details, but just to let you know that if it's a good test, it'll look like that and a 50% flip of the coin looks like that. Right? So this test is not much better than a 50% flip of the coin. But if you want a test that's got 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity, it would look like that. And you can see this test does not d uh, behave in that way when looked at in a population um, generally. Um, so, Stephanie Smith, slides are slightly out of order, Henry Kunkel was her doctor, um, identified this antibody at Rockefeller University, and the antibody we now know targets this protein which is present in all our bloods, called, which is now called SM. And this protein is actually a very important protein because it is in fact involved in how we transcribe genes, how our genes work in order for them to make proteins. So Stephanie Smith's antibody allowed people to identify this process. Um, and uh, so, so this antibody is targeting um, these proteins, and there's a whole complex of proteins, this SM proteins, that in fact constitutes nine proteins in together and cause for something called the spliceosome, which cuts up genes, splices genes um, as they are working in your body. And the body targets this protein when, uh, when, um, when you develop autoimmune diseases like SLE. And in 1965, Henry Kunkel and Eng Tam published this work from Stephanie Smith. And as you can see over here, in black is if you're positive. And you can see these are diseases along the x-axis over here. Here's SLE, here's scleroderma, polymyositis, um, rheumatoid arthritis, and so on. And the black is only positive when you have SLE or SLE is part of an overlap syndrome. But you can see there are a number of other people in the shaded bars that have SLE that don't have the antibody. And so the antibody is not that useful in making the diagnosis. This is actually from our clinical lab at the moment uh, where we looked at our cohort and we've got about 160 patients now who've agreed to participate in our trials and we looked at how we can measure antibodies to this protein. And as you can see, I've told you that is a flip of a coin. That is a little bit better than a flip of a coin. 0 0.67, 0 0.5 is a, is, a, is a flip of a coin. That would be the best test. And we tried to see whether we could, in fact, identify. Can I say one other thing? This is against normals. And if you have a test that can't distinguish somebody with SLE from somebody who's normal, it's a very bad test. <laughs> uh, this is against disease controls. In other words, people who have similar situations as people who have lupus, but they don't have lupus, so they also have kidney disease, or they also have a different cause of arthritis. But you want to be able to distinguish between the people who have it, one cause for kidney disease compared to the people who have, um, who have lupus. And it performs a little bit better, but it's still not as good as we would really like it to be. And so we made a whole lot of peptides from the SM protein and tried to see um, which peptides would be recognized. And as you can see here in pink, some of our peptides are recognized better than um, the protein itself from SM. And here's a whole lot of protein. And you can see that we're, in fact, in general, starting to improve the detection of antibodies to SM as we use these proteins. And here you can see when we use one peptide, we only detect about 18%. When we use a modified peptide, which we modify in a particular way that I'm not going to tell you today, um, as we increase the number of peptides and increase the modification, 
we reach the stage where now we can identify about 80% of people with SLE. So we've gone up by using this test from about 30% to about 80% of people, and it's still fairly specific. In other words, I said if you had SM antibodies, the way Henry Kunkel measured it in 1965, you've definitely got SLE. Well, that's still the case. If you've now, at 80% sensitivity, if you've got these antibodies, you still definitely have SLE. Uh, oh, and that's the most important slide of the presentation, which is now to show in our 160 patients how many of these patients are positive, how many of these people, how many of these individuals have antibodies to these peptides that we've derived from this protein called SM. And here is our cohort of SLE, and I can tell you that 90% um, 90 of them sorry, 80% of them, 80% of them are positive. They're 80% of the dots here are above this line. And with other diseases, very few are positive. And if they're positive, they're only low positives. And so we think we've improved the current test. And if you look at a rock analysis, which is the, 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 the um, graph I showed you previously, these are the ones I showed you previously against normals, not a very good test, against disease controls, not a very good test. Against normals now, we're almost as good as you can get. And against disease controls, well, we've still got a little way to go, but we are dramatically better than we used to be with the available technology. We also hope, and um, we have preliminary evidence, that um, if you monitor the level of antibody, you can predict the activity of people's disease. And the idea would be, in fact, if this works out, that we could predict people's activity before they presented, so that you would avoid somebody having to have a flare, which, because lupus is a disease which has remissions and flares, and it, um, it goes up and down, uh, and you want to be able to predict that somebody is going to flare so that you can introduce treatment before they flare so that the inflammation that they have in their kidney or their heart or their lungs doesn't cause damage when those organs are inflamed. And we have some evidence that we think we can actually do that because we think we do that with anti-double-stranded DNA antibodies and our preliminary results show that levels of anti-SM very much mimic the levels of anti-double-stranded DNA antibodies. And so we think, oh, we think we've, um, the, these studies help us understand the role uh, of anti-SM antibodies in the diagnosis of SLE um, and help us understand, or may help us understand, exactly how SLE develops itself if we can understand which of these peptides from SM are actually the targets of the, uh, Im of the immune inflammation or the immune response. All of this work was done by Ren Fen Chen, who's one of the PhD students in my lab, and I'd like to thank him and acknowledge him, as well as all the patients who've donated serum and cells for these studies, as well as a whole lot of people within our laboratory and our hospitals uh, who've been very generous as well in helping us. Thank you very much. This one changes colour when you track it. Just wait till the end of this seminar. Um, we just have one more thing to uh, uh, before morning tea break. Uh, I'd just like to introduce uh, Carol O'Carroll from the Garvin Research Foundation, who's going to briefly speak to you about the activities of the foundation. Good morning, everybody. It's my great privilege to be working for the Garvin Research Foundation. Um, we're like the sales and marketing side of the Institute. And uh, you might be sitting here this morning thinking, well, why do we put on these fantastic seminars and have them webcast now? And you could be sitting at home watching this. Or a little later on, picking it up as a podcast. And it's all for free. Well, the reason for that is it's all part of the Garvin's DNA, you could say, 
that we love to involve the community in what we're doing here at the Garvin, to inform you, to let, us know what's, to let you know what's going on. And it's a little bit like our um, staircase that's in our main area outside. You know, this uh, part of the, the DNA that's represented there shows a great openness and transparency. So not only do our research groups all talk to each other, so our bone people are talking to our brain people and our cancer people are talking to our bone and our brain people and so forth, but we love to talk to the community because the community are like the supports that are helping us to reach our goal, which are breakthroughs, the light at the top there are breakthroughs in many different research areas. The foundation um, is it's the area that actually deals with the community to bring philanthropic dollars in to help to support the science that's going on here at the uh, Garvin. So as Tree was mentioning um, earlier, his SUSY or two photon microscope was actually um, due to philanthropic endeavours or funds from the community that helped to buy that piece of research um, equipment. Because when we apply for government grants, and we do get a number, quite a number of very good government grants, but they will not fund equipment. So it's not much good for a scientist to not have his equipment. And also they don't fund novel projects. So if a, a scientist has this brilliant idea and uh, wants to get started with it, can't get government funding at that point. So we rely very heavily on support from the community to get these novel projects up and these great new ideas started. And also we help to um, supplement the money that comes in for the PhD students for their salaries so they don't have to just live on two minute noodles for the whole time they're here. <laughs> Guess who's turning 50 next year? No, it's not me. Uh, <laughs> but the Garvin is actually turning 50 next year which is very exciting. It's an extremely exciting time here um, for the Garvin. We're actually coming into our prime, I think, like most of us at 50, coming into our prime and beyond. Um, but our new professor, uh, our new executive director, Professor Matic, has actually said that we are very well placed internationally at the forefront of this new revolution in science which is genomics, and the study of genes and so forth. And the Garvin is very much a leader in this area. So it is a, a really fantastic, exciting time to be part of the Garvin. So for every dollar that we get through grants, we have to rely on, um, we need to raise another 70 cents to help our research take part, take place. So I'd just like to tell you there are many ways that you could partner with us to help support these brilliant scientists and their work. You might be considering, you might already do it, to donate to us and if you're on a webcast viewing at this moment you can go onto our, web, our website at the end and make a donation. Or you might like to sign up for a regular gift, you know, on a monthly basis. Or perhaps take part in one of our events. In fact, Rob Brink and myself ran in the city to surf two years ago. He did a lot better than I did, but anyway, I won't be doing that again. <laughs> but I will be there to encourage anyone else who wants to go ahead with it. And um, so we do events, we have morning teas, and um, a very special thing that you might consider doing is to leave a gift in your will when the time is right, no matter how large or small it is, because it all helps to contribute to our endowment fund which is just going to be there for the future of our work, for our brilliant scientists to be able to call on when they have these what-if ideas and they're able to put them into play, into play in the future to help not only our children but our children's children and everybody's children. So if you'd like to know a bit more about um, how you might be able to partner with us at this very exciting time in the Garvin's history, Please come out and see us at um, morning tea, have a cup of tea or coffee with us and if you're watching on the webcam, you can click on and donate afterwards. Thanks very much. We'd better make a start in the interest of time. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our, our, our next speaker, uh, Professor Connie Catalaris.
Uh, Connie is a Professor of Allergy and Immunology at the University of Western Sydney and at Campbelltown Hospital. Her particular interests are allergic disorders in children and adults and autoimmune disorders. Uh, her research interests include uh, aerobiological research, in particular pollen allergy, latex allergy and, and clinical drug trials. Uh, Professor Catalaris holds an executive position on the World Allergy Organisation Board where she is involved in international education programs and she is president-elect of the Asian Pacific Association of Allergy, Asthma and Clinical Immunology. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Connie, who today is going to talk to us about how food allergy impacts on the individual, family and society. Please welcome Connie Kalaris. Thank you very much, and uh, it's a pleasure indeed to be here um, all the way from the southwest to come to the east is, is quite a novel way to spend my day. I, I spend uh, my time between uh, rooms at Westmead and uh, a hospital and university service in the southwest of Sydney at, at Campbelltown. You may or may not be relieved to know that uh, I don't think I mentioned T or B cells in my talk, <laughs> but I am going to talk about an incredibly important and growing problem, and that is one of food allergy. Food allergy now affects up to 10% of our infants and young children, and we have uh, the distinguished position here in Australia of having one of the highest prevalence rates of food allergy in the whole world. And to ask the question why and what we can do about it is, is uh, a very big question and one that at the moment we can't answer but clearly it's a, a fruitful area for research. Most of you in this audience, I would guess, have been affected in some way by food allergy. You are either a parent, a grandparent or a carer of an infant or child with food allergy. You may have been a teacher, a preschool teacher, a primary teacher that had children in your classes. And if you work in anything to do with the food industry, you will be aware that more and more people ask for very specific uh, descriptions of the food that they are eating for this very reason. I want to start with a little case history of a girl I saw towards the end of last year. Her name is Elise. She's 14 years old and she's a high school student. She came to me by a very strange route. I was actually rung by the school and said, we know you've got a long waiting list but we need you to see this family immediately because we need clarification of her problem. She actually had been the target of bullying by her so-called friends and classmates who were chasing her around the playground saying they had peanut butter on their hands and that they were going to touch her. And if you're shocked by that, we know from surveys that up to 30% of children with food allergy are actually bullied via their food allergy in their school facility. Her mother had complained. Mum was a fairly abrasive person and perhaps had got the teachers a bit offside, but you can really understand her anxiety. This child had a very long history of peanut allergy, but had not been anywhere near any medical review for many years, and that was another story in itself. And consequently, she had no so-called anaphylaxis action plan and no EpiPen. When you look more deeply into the story, there had been many errors in the management of this child. There'd been a lack of a firm diagnosis right at the onset when she'd had her so-called acute reaction. She'd continued to have funny sort of reactions through her early childhood and early teen years, but no correct history had been really taken, and the mother's concerns were rather dismissed. And as I say, she was a difficult customer, and you could see why people didn't sort of spend too much time with her, and that's no excuse. And this family then had lived with the burden of the label of peanut allergy for this 13 years of this child's life. So more of a lease later. What I want to do is give you some idea of what food allergy is, talk about its prevalence, but most importantly today I want you to go away with the feeling that this is a condition that has a great impact. Yes, we deal with autoimmune diseases, we deal with relatively rare diseases, SLE being one of the less rare diseases, but this disease is affecting up to 10% of our young children and it has huge consequences for the child and for the family. So what is food allergy? Well, you can be very broad in your definition 
and talk about an adverse health effect arriving, arising from a specific immune response that occurs reproducibly on exposure to a given food. And that distinguishes true food allergy from all the other adverse events of food. So you might overeat cherries and get a bit of gut distension and bloating and diarrhoea. That is not a food allergy. We have a schema of classifying adverse food reactions in general, but what I'm going to do today is focus completely on the immune-related food allergy and more specifically on what we call the IgE-mediated food allergic reactions. These are the ones that take place because your body makes an allergic antibody to a particular food protein in that food. And every time you have a small amount of that food, you will react in a fairly standard variety of ways. Now if you go out and do surveys in the general population and ask, do you believe you have a food allergy? 20% of our population will say, yes, I have a food allergy. And clearly that's a huge overestimate. If we go ahead and take those that purport to have a food allergy and attempt to confirm it with specific tests, we find that in adulthood, about 1-2% to of our population have a, a food allergy as I have defined it. And in general, if you look worldwide, 6-8% to of children, but very, very nice data out of Melbourne show us that up to 10% of our infants and very young children now uh, have some form of food allergy. There's no doubt that this is an increasing problem and it has increased by an enormous amount in the last 20 years. Peanut allergy has tripled in the last 15 to 20 years. Now while there, every food on earth can have the possibility of stimulating an allergic food reaction, and I must say in my time in clinical practice I've seen some very weird and wonderful things, um, we know that about 90% of all food allergic reactions occur to this handful of foods. Peanut and tree nuts, egg, wheat, milk, seafood of any description, soy and sesame. And which one predominates depends a little bit where in the world you live, but overall 90% of food allergic reactions are caused by these foods. In Australia, Egg is the, is the commonest cause of food allergic reactions, followed by peanut and milk. So what does a food allergic reaction look like? Well, the most common way that infants and children react is by having a skin reaction. Most commonly around the mouth where the food is touched, they turn red and may welt up and have what we call hives. But that may become a generalised reaction and the child may look very red, will be distressed because they're itchy and hot and then they may welt up. And this is what these photos are showing you here. And they may get what we call angioedema, which is a swelling that occurs more deeply in the skin and can puff the eyes right up till they close over, a very dramatic and frightening occurrence if you've never seen it before. But what we all fear is a generalised systemic reaction that we call anaphylaxis. And the definition here is, is the sort of textbook de definition. Anaphylaxis is a generalised reaction, meaning it affects more than one system, most commonly the skin, the respiratory tract, the gut and the cardiovascular system. And it's usually of rapid onset and it can be overwhelming and it can lead to death. And that is the fear and worry that these parents of children with food allergy live with. If we then just concentrate for a couple of minutes on those who succumb to food allergy by having a fatal anaphylactic event, it is hard to quantitate how, how frequently this occurs. But in the studies that have been done, we know that there are some risk factors that help us target those who are more at risk of having such an un unfortunate outcome from what might look like a simple allergy. Children and teenagers who have underlying asthma, particularly if they're not good at controlling their asthma and their asthma is active, more likely to die if they meet a food they're allergic to and they have a generalised reaction. Children, and now I'm talking more about teenagers and young adults, who deny their symptoms, who poo-poo it and say, well, mum's been neurotic about it all my life, you know, it can't be that bad. They are particularly at risk 
of a fatal food anaphylactic reaction. Those who don't have adrenaline in a self-administered form to give themselves promptly on recognition of the onset of their condition are also more likely to die from their food allergic reaction. And those who have previously had a severe reaction, that group is also at more risk. The pity about deaths from food allergic um, reactions is that the vast majority of those who die knew of their food allergy. It's not like it's the first time and they didn't know. It's that they have been caught out for one or more reasons. The key foods that are tied up in, in anaphylactic deaths overwhelmingly is peanut, followed by other nuts, some form of seafood, milk and egg. And sometimes the reaction that ends up causing death may have been a little atypical in that they may not have the prompt onset of the redness and itching and rash, which not always, but very commonly, is the first sign that something's going wrong. So the lack of a rash means that people are, uh, sort of have a false sense that they're not having a reaction. But how it, it is really important to stress, though, because there's a lot of fear and worry out there, that it is almost never heard of that you would have an anaphylaxis from a mere touch from a food. That skin contact alone or exposure to food allergies rarely occasions an anaphylactic reaction. It may bring about a rash, but it rarely goes on to a generalised problem. Now, the risk of having an anaphylaxis um, is... Uh, I'm sorry, the risk of having a fatal anaphylaxis overwhelmingly occurs in children over the age of five and more commonly in teenagers. So while anaphylaxis in general is far more common in the under five-year-old group, it is incredibly rare for a child under five to die of a food-related anaphylaxis. And interestingly, and perhaps not surprisingly, most commonly these reactions occur outside the home where mum or dad or the carer doesn't have the same control as they have in their own home. And that fact has been shown both in the UK and the USA. What about in Australia? Well, we have some nice data that informs our own situation. Earlier this decade, there was a survey that uh, looked at parent-reported anaphylaxis. So remember, anaphylaxis is the generalised reaction, not just getting a little bit red with the food. About 0.59 per 100 children, parents report, have actually had a generalised reaction to a food. And as I said, the majority are in the preschool aged child. Whereas with deaths, as it has been found in the UK and the USA, in Australia, more than 90% of fatal reactions occur in children who are older than five years, and unfortunately, those who have known what their allergy is. These graphs are interesting and they're taken from a fairly recent publication and they show us the rate of anaphylactic admissions to our hospital. And on the far graph over there you can see that from 1994 to the decade to 2004-2005 there has been a very steady increase in the number of admissions for anaphylaxis through our ED departments. Um, both for food-related anaphylaxis and non-food-related anaphylaxis, which is the uh, top of the two curves. So both have increased, and again, the reasons here are complex. Somewhat reassuringly, on this graph on this side here, which plots out the fatalities from anaphylaxis, both from food and non-food-related causes, that has remained static. So while we've seen an increase in anaphylaxis, it does appear that we are keeping the lid on how many people we lose from this unfortunate generalised allergic reaction. Here in Australia, we do have good policies, we do have ready access to self-administered adrenaline, and we do, in general, have good first responses with our ambulance force. What I want to do now in the second part of this talk is just get you to pause and think about what the impact of having a food allergy, and in particular, having the concern about having an anaphylactic reaction to a food does for a family, for an individual, for a family, and what we as a society should be concerned about. There is no doubt that having the risk of having an anaphylactic reaction hanging over one's head 
impairs one's quality of life. It may induce great anxiety and it can certainly lead to significant social and family disruption as it did in my little patient uh, Elisa's case. We know from studies that have been done that the quality of life in a child who suffers a severe food allergy has been reported to be worse than a child with diabetes. And really when you think about that, that's quite extraordinary. Because for a child to live with diabetes, it means they're facing injections every single day of their life. It means they have to be very strict with how they eat, how much exercise they do, and how they run their life every single day. Food allergy, you think, well, you know, as long as you stay away from the food, you, you'll be all right. But the degree of worry that is engendered by the possibility that you will meet a food that may take your life is an enormous burden. So, the first thing, and it is the job of the medical profession, is to provide a correct diagnosis. How do we diagnose food allergy? Number one, we need very clear thinking about what it is we're looking for. We must not bandy around the term allergy for any adverse effect. We are talking specifically here about people who make a specific immune response to a food protein. And we need to apply correct testing for that. Most commonly done as an allergy test on the skin, which is non-threatening and non-dangerous in any form, done correctly. And sometimes we use blood tests for that. But unfortunately, in 2012, the only test with 100% sensitivity and specificity, to use Stephen's terminology applied to a test, is to do what we call a food challenge, where we feed the food to the particular child. Now we do that in a couple of circumstances. Firstly, we do it to confirm a diagnosis when the history and the testing do not marry up. <coughs> While it's confronting and it has its risk, it is the only way to give certainty and clarity. And secondly, we spend a great deal of our time challenging children as they become older we're watching the tests change and we're asking the question, has this child become tolerant to the food and does this child no longer have to be worried as they've been worried up to that point in time? Because although it's a huge problem in infants and preschool children, food allergy by and large in the majority of cases becomes less severe with increasing age and many children lose their food allergy. That is particularly so with milk and egg allergy but unfortunately it is far less so with peanut, tree nut and seafood allergy. And so we do what is shown here in the bottom of the picture, we challenge the child with the food. And you can imagine, just think about it, a child who's lived with this for years, you mustn't touch the food, and we come up to them with the food and say, eat it. We have to do this with great sensitivity and we have to do it in the safest possible way. So it is very resource heavy. We have to do this in a hospital with trained staff, around that child the whole time and it takes about four hours to do a proper food challenge. The burden of this to our allergy services is enormous. And I know we're here in this wonderful institute at the Garvin, and, but I unashamedly make a plea to you to consider that where I work down in the southwest, where we have the majority of young children, we are resource poor. We desperately need funding to help us in our endeavour to investigate and research food allergy where our children live and go to school. I do also want to say one of my other passions, and that is spurious tests, shonky tests for food allergy abound in the community. There are many, many people out there that go by the name of naturopaths and homeopaths that will take your money for a quick fix and a quick diagnostic test so that you don't have to do challenges. And these are some of the tests that are offered. You can get these over the internet, you can get them down the street. There is no evidence or justification for applying these tests for a diagnosis of a serious, potentially serious medical problem. And anyone who is interested in that, I refer you to this wonderful uh, internet site, quackwatch.com. <laughs> so how do we manage food allergy? Well, education is the key. Unfortunately, in 2012, we have no cure. As I said, some of our children will outgrow their food allergy, but until that time happens, we can't change it. And for that group that doesn't grow out of it, 
at, as yet we can't alter the immune responsiveness. So education about preparedness to treat a reaction and most importantly how to avoid the food is paramount. And we need to manage the risk at every level of society. For the child and for his family, we give detailed information and dietary advice about how to avoid the food allergen. For those children that we deem at risk from anaphylaxis, we write out a detailed plan and this is taken to the preschools and the schools. We are keen in certain circumstances for the child to have a medic alert or similar device labelling their, their possibility of a problem. And for those children that we gauge are at risk of an anaphylactic reaction, we equip them with the knowledge and the provision of a self-administered adrenaline pen. Now I want to spend a few minutes talking about the impact of having this diagnosis on quality of life. And we're very big about quality of life these days in medicine because we've recognised that just having a good treatment or a good management is not enough. We have to do things with patients, with their families, to actually improve the way they live despite their diagnosis. And that's what we mean broadly by quality of life. So what are the issues around food allergy? Well, basically the morbidity is low. I mean, if you're not eating the food, you're completely well. And while it's terrible that people do die of food anaphylaxis, it is rare for that to happen. But however, there's no cure for food allergy, as I've said. And the impact on daily life and social interaction is very, very significant for the child and the family. If you look at studies asking parents about the health of their food allergic child compared to the health of their child without the allergy, it is amazing that most of them think that the child with food allergy is physically impaired in some way. Yet we know they're not. They can run and jump and participate in sport, no worry. But parents' perception is that that child is weaker and physically less well. In families, there can be huge disruption in usual activities. Socialisation is often shunned by these families because they can't stand the anxiety. There's mistrust of other people preparing food. There's huge anxiety about travel, going on a plane, going to somewhere else where somebody else is in charge of food preparation. And we see time and time again, after we do a challenge and lift that label, that the challenge is negative, the child can therefore eat that food, the change in the family is absolutely enormous. They start to go out, they're willing to go to restaurants, the child goes to parties without a guardian. It's an amazing change. Parental attitudes have also been examined. Many pa parents have what we can label as separation anxiety from their food allergic child. Many of them delay putting their child into preschool because they're concerned about handing over the watchfulness to, it, to somebody else. These parents will say, yes, we know we're hypervigilant. Our children describe us as neurotic. But if you put yourself in their position where it's their job to keep that child safe, you can understand this overprotection that often develops. And that in itself can stunt the growth and development of the child and the young teenager. If you talk to adolescents about food allergy, they crave to be understood by their peer group. They need the support. They're very embarrassed about wearing <coughs> medic alert discs. Many of them hide the fact that they have an EpiPen. Some of them, it is the risk-taking age, will take risks. They'll say, oh, look, mum's told me this all my life. I don't believe it anymore. Let's see how it goes. This is the age when our young people are starting to experiment at parties and have alcohol and, God forbid, drugs. They lose the control that's been instilled in them and they will take risks at those times. So it's no wonder that this is the group at risk of death from anaphylaxis. Both parents and children with food allergy express frustration with the external influences they have to handle. Major frustrations with the lack of so-called public understanding, unwillingness to accommodate their very special needs, and often with the medical profession for giving inconsistent advice. One of their major frustrations comes with the whole food labelling bit, and I'll deal with that. How has society handled this food allergy epidemic and the worries that it engenders? Well, I believe we've done some of this very well. We have very good policies in our child cares, our preschools and our schools, because they are the brunt of the major impact 
of having to care for food allergic individuals. There's been very careful policy development and implementation. Cornerstones of these policies is to number one, obtain reliable medication, uh, medical information which is communicated via a standardised action plan for the management of the child. Second, is to have a good education routine for teachers, preschool teachers and so on, about the risk of anaphylaxis and how to recognise it. And third, age appropriate education of children within those facilities. We aim for risk minimisation with regards to particular foods, particularly nuts, because that's the one that really um, persists. We do not recommend wholesale bans of these foods. Why? Because number one, it's totally unpoliceable, it's impractical, it engenders sort of false complacency because they think there's no peanut or whatever in the school. And it's not training a child in what they need to do to protect themselves. So we don't advocate banning foods from school. We advocate risk minimisation and management that is age appropriate. And I come back to Elise. Bullying by provoking food allergic children with their food is really recognised as a risk factor for bullying um, in schools these days and needs to have policies around it. So let's look at society in general's adaptation to the food allergy epidemic. As I said, the majority of food-related anaphylactic deaths occur outside the home. And as I said, unfortunately, most who succumb, succumb to a food they already know they're allergic to and they consumed it because they thought it was safe. So we need to focus on our food outlets. Sources of accidental exposures in food preparation come from uninformed food handling staff, lack of labelling, complexity of labelling, residues of foods on utensils and so on. So there needs to be a huge upskilling within the food industry in general. And that is occurring and that is happening. So I want to talk about food labelling. You see, food allergy started off as being a problem for an individual, for a small minority. But now, with up to 10% of our young children affected, it has to be seen as a significant public health problem and needs to be dealt with at that level. And so this has led to, to legal and moral responsibility that food allergen exposure be handled properly. And this is reflected in legislation now in many parts of the world. So the food labelling has been an enormous problem and if you talk to people with the problem and their, their parents, this causes them more angst than any other single part of managing the problem. Many people, even though they've had education about it, do not interpret labels correctly. And I tell you what, when you look at some of the labels, there's no, no doubting why. This is taken from uh, a particular food and we'll just have a look. You've got wheat flour mentioned here more than once. You've got herbs and spices in one part of the label, then down the bottom you've got made on equipment that contains mustard. Is mustard a herb and spice or is that something I have to worry about? Celery is mentioned under contains but not under ingredients. It's a mess. Look at this label. This is peanut butter, okay? What does it say? It says it contains peanuts, which I suppose is reassuring if what you've bought is peanut butter. <laughs> But then it says may contain traces of nuts, so what else is in it? I mean, what, how do you interpret that? Does that mean if you've got a tree nut allergy, you could eat this safely or not? We don't know. I mean, this is, this is terrible. This just gives you some idea of some of the wording that is written on processed food labels. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. If you don't have to worry about it, you can glance over this. But if you have a child you've got to keep safe, what the heck does this mean? So in Australia, I'm pleased to report, there was something called the Allergen Bureau set up in 2005 and it was an, a, a voluntary initiative of the Food and Grocery Council and it operates on a membership basis. And their objective is to share information and experience within the food industry to manage this in a rational way. They have come up with a list of the most important food ingredients that must be declared and they are affiliated with another um, risk management tool called VITAL, which stands for Voluntary Incidental Trace Allergen Labelling. Don't worry about that. But this has become a really good tool because these people 
look at the research that's done worldwide to give good and, and um, standardised information about the lowest level of allergen that may be a risk to a person. So they're looking for the impact of allergen cross-contact and they've distilled everything into making one precautionary statement which they'd like to see implemented. So they are concerned with working out threshold levels that may be dangerous to somebody with a food allergy, multiplying that by tenfold for a safety factor, and then stating that if you think with your processing or with the foods, substances you're using in your processing, that that threshold may not be met, then you write on your label, may be present. One label that says, don't touch this food if you have a peanut allergy. And no advisory warning if you know that you're way be be below the threshold level. And most people worldwide feel that that is a very sensible stand to take. So labels will be standardised. There will be ingredients that are clearly labelled. Underneath, it will state the allergenic foods that this, this particular thing contains. And then those that may have small amounts that are deemed a possible risk will be stated as being maybe present. It's a much more rational way, much easier to teach people to read labels correctly. So what about my girl Elise? Well, at least the incident at school, as horrible as it was, brought her for review. I did specific testing for allergic antibody to nuts and she was negative. I took her to the hospital and because she was old and had so many preformed ideas about it, I did what we call a blinded challenge where I took the nut and I ground it up and I hid it in something savoury like a spaghetti bolognese so she couldn't taste it or see it. So I removed any emotive uh, reaction she may have. And lo and behold, I did it to the two nuts she thought she was allergic to, to peanut and hazelnut, and she had no reaction whatsoever. So in the blinking of an eye after we finished that challenge, that label was removed not only from Elise, but that huge burden from mum that she'd lived with for 13 out of Elise's 14 years had suddenly gone. I was able to write a letter back to the school saying, this child is now tolerant to these foods, and the school had to deal with the bullying incident in its own right. So I hope in this uh, brief time together I've given you uh, a, perhaps a better insight and understanding into what people who have food allergy live with day by day and the burden that this places on families and the burden that we should share as a society looking after these children. Thank you. Um, just before we move on to the last talk, I want to just mention that uh, we are running a bit over time and it's, it's nearly noon now, so if anyone needs to uh, get a bus or something uh, at this point, you're, uh, you're most welcome to, to go and do that. Uh, we just have one, one more talk to go and that uh, is Garvin's own uh, Cecile King. So Cecile King is a Senior Research Fellow and Group Leader in Garvin's Immunology Research Program. She established her lab at Garvin in 2005 after she completed her postdoctoral work uh, in type 1 diabetes at the, at the famous Scripps Institute in San Diego. Uh, there she focused on how cytokines uh, can act on immune cells to influence the development of type 1 diabetes. And Cecile's group at Garvin is looking at the role of genetically linked cytokines in immunity and autoimmunity. And today she's going to talk about type 1 diabetes and autoimmune diseases of the gut. Please welcome Dr. Cecile King. Thank you for all staying so long. Um, I hopefully won't be going over time and hopefully I can keep you awake just long enough. And uh, I realise you're probably also getting hungry because it's almost lunchtime. Um, so I'm just going to do something tricky because of the time limit. I'm going to stick a timer on this. Um, So, um, as Rob said very nicely, I work on, um, as I study uh, autoimmune diseases, we're particularly interested in, in type 1 diabetes and uh, other autoimmune diseases that affect accessory organs of the digestive system, such as the salivary glands, uh, and that would be Sjogren's syndrome. 
So I'll give you a little bit of background of what scientists do, and of course we don't all look like that. But we basically follow um, a very similar scheme when we're, when we're heading towards a therapeutic target. We make a simple observation, often that's made in vitro, you know, in the old days we'd say in a test tube. Um, then we have to move on to animal models, and some animal models are particularly um, useful to disease. Um, we have animal models where, um, where we get a spontaneous development of disease, um, and some of them are so good, like the ones that we use, that they're, they're now termed preclinical models, but ultimately we all want uh, to move this into humans, and of course the third step is clinical trials. The tr in terms of the choice of animal models, we work a lot with mice, um, and not just because they're small and cute. Um, it's because the murine immune system is very, very similar to the human immune system. So the things that we can discover in uh, the immune system in a mouse, we can then... Um, are likely to be relevant to human, human disease as well. And of course, clinical trials are very important. They're, they go into multiple stages, um, um, and that's to ensure that the drug is effective and the side effects minimal. Now, I think Rush probably go through this a little bit quickly because Rob just, and, uh, and Tree described very nicely the immune system. Um, we study a subset of cells called T cells. They're part of the white blood cells that, that, are, that you can find in your blood. Um, and their job is to eliminate foreign, foreign agents such as viruses and bacteria. Um, in autoimmune diseases such as type 1 diabetes, T cells actually attack our own tissues. Um, and one of the immunological conundrums, uh, I suppose, for the treatment of type 1 diabetes is that the same cells that destroy the pancreatic islets where insulin is produced are actually beneficial for immunity against viruses and bacteria. Okay, so type 1 diabetes has a prevalence of about 1 in 200. It's increasing every year. Um, a lot of you would have heard of type 2 diabetes. Um, it's a very common disease. I should note that there's about 270 Australians that are diagnosed um, each day with with, with diabetes of some sort. Um, and the, the definition that we used to hold between type 1 and type 2 diabetes is actually, there's a lot of grey areas. So what you find in a lot of type 1 diabetics is there's metabolic dysfunction. Um, and in type 2 diabetes, you have inflammation in the pancreas, which is where insulin is produced. So there's a, there's a lot of merge, but we, we kind of, we have these categories that, um, and in, in, in this sort of definition here, um, it's really referring to the one that we know um, has no metabolic dysfunction um, early on and it's usually diagnosed in children. Okay, so um, it can occur at any age, but as I said, it usually starts in people younger than 30 uh, and the symptoms are usually severe and they occur rapidly. It's an autoimmune etiology um, because the autoimmune, because the immune cells of our body actually attack and destroy the insulin-producing cells in the islets of the pancreas. Um, you have to have a significant amount of uh, loss of function of insulin-producing cells or destruction of those cells before you're diagnosed with diabetes. So by the time people come in and get diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, uh, the, the majority of their insulin producing cells are already lost. Um, and of course insulin is really important because it controls the body's utilisation of glucose and we need that um, to turn our food into energy. One other fact I wanted to point out to you quickly was that if you're a patient suffering from one autoimmune disease you have a much higher chance um, um, than someone who isn't of acquiring another autoimmune disease or symptoms of another autoimmune disease. Um, I should quickly go here. So, so for the treatment of type 1 diabetes, um, basically what we uh, have to do is inject insulin or, um, or we then move towards the option of getting an islet transplantation where we have to have um, a new source of insulin producing cells actually put into our body. There's a huge problems and hurdles for islet transplantation, um, obviously because um, your body 
has its own molecular signature. So as Rob described, if you put in tissue that's not perfectly matched to your own tissue, you get this thing called um, um, allorejection of the, of the transplanted tissue. Uh, so we have that problem, which is, a, um, which is a rejection problem. But we also have the problem that the autoimmunity that destroyed the insulin-producing cells in the first place is still there. So when you put in the, these fresh new insulin-producing cells in the graft, they're likely to get destroyed by the, by the immune system that's, that's in the patient. However, I just wanted to point out that before insulin was discovered, Type 1 diabetes was a, a lethal disease. Um, basically, people need to take this daily, but, but we can easily forget what an important discovery it was in 1921 when Banting and Best found that insulin was secreted by islet cells and then they isolated and purified it. So this is um, a thin section of um, a pancreas, and we just take a, a very thin slice through the pancreas and um, there we go. And this is the exocrine pancreas here um, and the endocrine pancreas stains insulin here. So you can see these insulin producing cells um, in a section of the pancreas. What happens in type 1 diabetes is you get a lot of inflammation um, around the insulin producing cells you can see here. What's contained in this group of sort of swarming mass of cells is, um, is immune cells, uh, including T cells and B cells and macrophages and dendritic cells. Um, and they ultimately uh, consume the islet here. Um, and you either see completely loss of function, um, so the cells can't produce insulin anymore, or you see genuine destruction of the insulin producing cells in the islet. Okay, um, I think I've already covered this but down here, but I just wanted to, to note that, that there is a genetic predisposition in type 1 diabetes, but only 30% uh, concordance in twin studies, and only 15% of people with an immediate family member go on to develop type 1 diabetes. There is a very strong environmental influence, um, and it is suggested that this, the environmental incidence is probably has a lot to do with the increasing incidence of disease um, because it can't really be explained by genetic modification of, of the human population over the past 20 years. Okay, so these are the kind of things that we think about um, in terms of research and trying to work out the, uh, what causes type 1 diabetes and I'll just go through it quickly. Um, we think about what, what is actually triggering it, and there's factors that can initiate inflammation and self-destruction of, 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 of our own tissue. Um, what maintains the chronic inflammation? So once you've actually discovered what could trigger it, it's, it's very important to work out what can maintain it, because we all get inflammation, and we all get inflammation outside our normal lymphoid organs. Um, as, as Tree pointed out beautifully, you have, we have like a trillion immune cells going through our blood every day um, and it's recirculating through tissues and then back through into, into our lymphoid organs. Um, most people get inflammation but there are only some people um, in which that inflammation um, is not resolved. Um, and this is very important in terms of autoimmune disease where you see destruction of tissue uh, following um, this sort of mild mild form of inflammation um, that stays longer than it should in some people. <clears throat> and of course, and what, what determines the organ specificity of autoimmune disease? We can get systemic autoimmune diseases like lupus, um, but why is it that some people get a particular um, uh, inflammation in, in the kidneys, but other people get it in the pancreas or the salivary glands? And why is it that some people get or get multiple autoimmune uh, symptoms. Okay, in terms of triggers, one of the very well-known triggers for autoimmune disease is virus infection. Um, in terms of type 1 diabetes, enterovirus infection, such as Coxsackie B4 virus, um, um, has been shown to be associated with the development of type 1 diabetes in a, in a number of uh, seroepidemiological studies. And, and this is just a histological 
um, analysis of the pancreas of a type 1 diabetic, diabetic showing reactivity to VP1, which is a, a peptide from, from a Coxsackie B uh, virus. Um, and it's not in control. You can't find it in controlled pancreas tissue. So it's very common um, for type 1 diabetics to, to have enterovirus um, proteins in, in the pancreas, or more common than a normal population. So this may be one of the triggers that could actually initiate the inflammation. But what keeps it there? Um, normally when we get a virus infection, we get a lot of inflammation and it goes away. Um, one of the things that could continue um, inflammation and turn it in from a, like an acute episode to chronic inflammation is how uh, immune cells interact in that lesion. Um, and one, one way that they interact is through the production of growth factor cytokines. Um, uh, and these are really chemical messengers that allow cells to communicate with each other. Cells tend to, as you saw you know, in, in live, in trees, trees footage, is that cells really interact with each other a lot. It's a very dynamic situation. And a lot of these signals delivered between cells occur across very, very short distances. And so two cells that kind of stick together, one cell can produce a growth factor that then influences the other cell and its behaviour. And this is pretty much how the immune system works in terms of these things that we call, <coughs> we call cytokines. And of course cytokines have been shown to, to directly affect um, the, the lifespan of beta cells. It can kill beta cells. Um, and it can also interact with, um, with other cells to, to influence whether they become um, killer, killer T cells that can then go ahead and, and destroy insulin producing cells in the islands. Okay, so one of the cytokines that we're very interested in is called interleukin-21. It doesn't really matter um, what it's called. It, we'll just call it IL-21 for short. It is a fascinating cytokine and, it's, and it's, it, it has a, a lot of effects on immune cells. It's produced by one type of cell, which is a CD4 T cell. Um, and it is contained on this locus that has been shown to be associated through genome-wide association studies um, with an enormous number of autoimmune diseases, and I'll just show the list here. So this is autoimmune diseases and chronic inflammation. This locus, which contains um, two cytokines very close to each other, keeps popping up. So for, for colitis, um, which is a which is a chronic inflammation in celiac disease, but you find it in bowel disease, you find it in arthritis, um, all types of arthritis, lupus, and type 1 diabetes. So this cytokine <coughs> is also very important for the development of type 1 diabetes in a model, a mouse model that we use. And the NOD mouse model actually spontaneously develops type 1 diabetes, and it provides a perfect... Um, uh, resemblance to human type 1 diabetes and, and we, we use it obviously um, as a preclinical model um, and try to cure it. One thing that you can do is you can genetically manipulate this mouse uh, that normally gets diabetes and this is a section of the pancreas that shows again this m sort of swarming mononuclear infiltration in the pancreas. If you, at the germline level, uh, genetically manipulate the mouse so that it doesn't have this cytokine anymore, the mouse never goes on to develop diabetes. It's always protected. It doesn't even get inflammation in the islets. So this cytokine is absolutely critical for the development of disease in this spontaneous model of type 1 diabetes. Okay, and one thing that we, we did a number of studies to try and work out why. We could use this adoptive transfer model, uh, and basically we can take, we can take different subsets of cells combine them together and transfer them in to see how um, disease is affected. And one thing that we could do is we could, we could do a transfer where the CD8 T cells, which are, the, which are these cells that do the kiss of death, um, lack the IL-21 receptor, and you combine them with, with other T cells and you transfer them into a mouse. And what we found that if they don't have the receptor for IL-21, which means that these cells cannot use IL-21 as a growth factor, you don't get diabetes. So it's absolutely essential in this model for these killer cells to soak up all this IL-21 um, in order to develop type 1 diabetes. 
that tells us something about the cell types that are required, but also tells us something about the growth factor uh, requirements for those cells. So we were very fascinated to look further into what cells make R21 in these mouse. So we looked immediately into the actual autoimmune lesions in the pancreas. And you can do that by purifying the mononuclear cells out of the islets. Um, and then doing flow cytometry, which is these pictures here that probably look a bit confusing to many of you. What this does is it, you, you just basically label your cells with, um, with a fluorescent tag and you can then use that method to determine whether they express certain receptors on their surface. And what we found is that the cells that make lots of R21 all express this receptor here. It's called CCR9. Um, and it's, it's a chemokine receptor um, that is really important for the interaction of immune cells in the gut. Um, so this is really a gut homing or a gut migration receptor that's expressed on T cells that we find in the autoimmune lesions of the pancreas. And I should say also, um, that I, I, really, yeah. I should also say that we, we, we did some histology and I'll show you those pictures here, but I just wanted to, to, to remind you here that antibodies that are produced normally by immune cells uh, to bind to pathogens such as bacteria and viruses, um, we can actually utilise those by tagging them with fluorescent markers um, and then using them to detect uh, particular immune cells in, in thin sections of tissue through a microscope. And what you can see here is the insulin producing cells, again we've got very thin sections of the pancreas, in, insulin producing cells in the pancreas are shown in blue, the CD4 T cells are shown in green and our CCR9 positive cells are shown in red. And you can, we've used this method to show um, that, here we go, our insulin here. Um, and you can see here, when they're merged, um, they actually start to look kind of yellow. So here we can show here that these CD4 T cells are actually expressing CCR9. And there's quite a lot of them, as shown in arrows here, throughout the... throughout the um, <coughs> pancreatic infiltrate. So these gut-derived or gut-homing T cells are actually a prominent part of the, of the infiltration of the pancreas. So they're not only found in the pancreas, and again, this is just, this is just showing you our detection of the cells here. This is the pancreas here, um, as opposed to the spleen and other lymphoid organs, um, and this larvae gland. And what you can find here is they're a really prominent part of the um, T cell population in the lesions of the salivary glands and the pancreas. We also looked in, um, in human subjects just in the blood so that, so that we were obviously interested always to, to, to determine whether this is you know, some kind of a biomarker for, for disease. And what we found here, um, as shown in this graph here, is that the most of the patient, most of the Sjogren's syndrome patients actually had very high levels of these CCR9 expressing T cells in their blood, um, and, and shown again here. Okay, so what what's uh, what does do salivary glands and pancreas have to do with each other and the gut? Well, obviously. Um, the pancreas is really, is just shown in yellow here, and it's actually right down here, kind of resting against the gut. A salivary gland is, a, is this is an accessory organ of the digestive system, um, and you can see the salivary glands here. They're also accessory organs of the digestive system. So I suppose the idea that, that, that immune cells that destroy these tissues could be activated in the gut, at least by physical association, and functional association is not really that far-fetched. And again, this is just showing the pancreas. <clears throat> you can see it really fits right against the duodenum um, and very, very closely associated uh, to the gut with, with, in terms of vessels and, and, um, and ducts. Okay, so what, what evidence is there that type 1 diabetes, for example, um, has anything to do with 
with what's going on in the gut. <coughs> first of all, oh yeah, first of all, we should, I, I suppose this really points out that we are absolutely full of, full of bacteria in our gut. And you might say that because the pancreas is so close to the intestine, that perhaps if there's some, something wrong or something going on there, then perhaps it could, it could spill over into, into the immune system around the pancreas and have an influence on it. And that's, and that's probably not that far-fetched. But we, we have pretty good mechanisms to prevent that. One of them is just the physical barrier of the intestinal wall. And this is shown here in a schematic diagram. And of course, compartmentalization is, uh, is extremely important in the immune system. We're, we're, most of you sitting here will have um, some kind of virus throughout your gut. Many of you will have rhinovirus in your, in your nose. We could probably pick it up by, by one of our um, molecular biological techniques. But, but most of you are not going to develop anything from those things. Um, it's how, it's how these bacteria and viruses actually get through into beyond the places where they're, they're kind of considered commensal organisms or, or, or resident <coughs> organisms. Um, and that requires really losing permeability through this barrier. Um, and there's a number of studies that have recently shown as our, as our technologies improve, we can actually look at individual microbiome is what we call it, but that's just looking at all the, all the types of viruses and bacteria you have in your gut. And, and we can actually test that now. Um, and, and what these studies have found is that each of you will have your own bacterial signature, and, and that lasts throughout life, and it's really quite unique to each person. Um, it's even very unique to you in terms of your own family. Um, and it does change over time. You can, you can change it with your diet. Um, and if you look in type 1 diabetic patients, what you find is, is the variability um, or the amount of, uh, uh, in terms of the, the flora in the gut of type 1 diabetics is very, very high. And that's a unique feature of type 1 diabetics. Um, instead of having the sort of stable backbone of, of bacteria, they have this sort of massive variation uh, constantly. Um, so that suggests that there's something going on there. Um, another thing that we know about type 1 diabetics is they have a thing that's called the leaky gut syndrome, um, uh, which is just basically increased small intestinal permeability. Um, and that's, that can be obviously influenced by, by diet but, and, and genetics as well. So that means that things that are normally meant to stay in the gut are more likely to leak over into where the immune system can actually be activated. Uh, we also know that in animal models, dietary interventions and viruses and everything that affects the guts also affects the uh, development of type 1 diabetes. So, because these cells in this model that we've been using um, of type 1 diabetes express CCR9, we really wanted to know can we stop diabetes occurring if we block migration of cells from the gut into the pancreas? And this shows here that you can. So this is our insulitis index, but I want you to focus over here into our cumulative diabetes incidence. And what you can see here is if we block this interaction, so we prevent cells from moving from the gut or to the gut, um, we, can, we can actually prevent diabetes occurring in, in this model that gets spontaneous type 1 diabetes. So obviously, we would hypothesize that the reason why these cells in the, in the pancreatic lesions express CCR9 um, is because they've been activated in the gut and they move there um, throughout life. Um, what's very important in those terms is why in some people do they stay in the pancreas. <laughs> the pancreatic um, Lesion is, is really a, like an open, open wound. It's, it's continually getting cells migrating in there and leaving there. Um, but in, in, in some cases, obviously, the cells stay and then they transition. Okay, so what we're looking at in the future and the garden in this, in this area of research is what are the precursors? Can we actually look in the gut and find the precursors of these cells that cause diabetes? Um, can we follow them up by the way they look or their function? Um, 
what, how they're activated in the gut, um, what happens to activate these cells, what turns this chemokine receptor on, um, and uh, what keeps IL-21, which is this potentially destructive cytokine, turned on in the pancreatic lesions of some people. And of course we're doing therapeutic targeting of IL-21 to try and neutralise it at different stages and we've got to work out when, when's the best time to block it to prevent disease. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Cecile. Um, well, that brings our talks to a close. I hope all your brains are full by now. Um, apologies, we've run a bit over time today. Um, if you could just join me one time in thanking all our speakers today, Stephen, Tree, Connie, and Cecile. <laughs> so in the interest of time, we, we won't have the public question and answer session. However, if you'd like to come and talk to the speaker, I know Connie's got patients waiting for her, but the rest of us uh, can, can hang around here for a while if anyone's got some burning questions. Just a couple of other things. Um, uh, if you'd like to complete the surveys and put them in the box near the exit at the rear on your way out, that would be great. And, and if you're interested, uh, next April is the Garvin Australian Spectacular Concert at the Sydney Town Hall on Saturday the 28th of April and flyers will be handed out at the exit. It just remains to thank you very much for your attendance today and your interest in, in, in our activities here. Uh, we really appreciate you coming along today and, and listening to us. And that includes all you online and uh, you listen to the podcast. So thank you once again and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.